All right. We're going to get broadcast here in a second. I just want to make sure the audio and everything's working. So it looks like I'm not frozen, which is good because sometimes it freezes up. I don't know if it does that, but and uh, hopefully you guys can hear me loud and clear. We're going to jump into the Facebook group here and get to work. Uh, Mo, I see you on here. Can you just help me monitor the comments on Facebook as well and just pop those into uh, the chat if we get any comments on Facebook? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, all right. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Douglas J. Beck here inside the Real Estate Investing Mastermind. And I so appreciate you being here, being part of our community, being part of our family inside the Real Estate Investing Mastermind group here on Facebook. Uh, today, we're going to be having fun talking about distressed real estate and kind of what to look for, what to watch out for, some of the analysis process. We just came out of our hot seat. We had one of our clients, Jasmine, actually bring a great deal that we had the opportunity to go through and kind of analyze and talk about different factors around you know, the rental property, uh, investing, the stuff like, you know, buy, renovate, rent, refi, understanding how that works, the renovation process to some extent, but more about the refinance and the DSCR loans, lots of interesting stuff that's pretty detailed. So again, every single week we have multiple conversations, including that hot seat inside the Growth Collective. If you're interested in more information about that, jointhegrowthcollective.com has a detailed video, about a five minute long video of me talking and explaining how it works and why it would be important for someone listening to this message right now inside of our free community, why you'd want to kind of upgrade and look at, you know, our, our private coaching group and seeing how that might bring value to you and your business. It's not just for the newer investors. We have investors of all levels. We have people collaborating, bringing capital, bringing deals, bringing experience, putting it all together, all kinds of cool stuff. So just really appreciate you guys taking a look at that. If you're interested, you can also feel free to shoot me a DM with any questions and we'll take it from there. Today, we're going to be talking about the stress real estate, like I said. We're going to be talking about renovation. We're going to be talking about what to look for, what to watch out for. I might share a couple of stories, right? Scenarios of scenarios that I've faced in our businesses and what I've seen my clients face as well. But more importantly, we're here for you, right? We're here to have you ask questions, to get clarity, to get interactive with you, to understand your situation, a challenge you might be facing or a scenario you might be facing that you're not sure how to handle. That's, again, what we do inside the Growth Collective every single week. And we get detailed and we get deep with our clients. We just spent almost an hour working on this deal with Jasmine, helping understand the clarity around what to do next and how to follow up and how to monitor what's going on. But ultimately seeing the numbers, understanding the numbers of the deal. That's part of what's called the hot seat discussion. So again, the hot seat is one of our meetings. We have a handful every week. And um, if you want to get a guest pass to the Growth Collective, that's something you can talk about after scheduling an appointment. Again, join the growthcollective.com. We'll get you that, that appointment and then go ahead and ask for a guest pass after you have your conversation. Happy to host you as a guest. And if anybody inside the Growth Collective wants to invite a guest, reminder that it's no issue. Just let us know. We'd love to have a guest in here. If it's somebody that's brand new or has experience, same thing. We want to pour value and give you guys what you need and answer your questions. So for today, first things first, let's go ahead and see who's in the room with us. So if you guys could do me a favor inside of Facebook and also inside of Zoom, I know we have Alicia, I see Andrew Otter as well. We got Gabriel, Ginger, Glenn, and Jenny. Uh, we have Kirsten, Janet, Jasmine, Mo, Norman, Cherry, and Wendy inside of Zoom. A lot of our uh, clients here. And then on Facebook, I want to see who we have listening to us today. So if you guys could do me a favor, just pop in where you're sitting right now. If you're in you know, Florida, New Jersey, somewhere else, whatever you're doing, city and state would be awesome. Let us know what you're working on and how it could be of most value. Go ahead and do that inside the chat, inside of the comments, I should say. Give us a comment about where you're sitting right now. If you hear me on Facebook. All right, we got Venice, Florida inside the room. Now we got a couple of New Jersey folks. And we've got New York, I know, in the room on, on Zoom here. Who else do we have inside of the Facebook group? Joelle Jean. Yes, Mo is helping us out with this. That's right. I see you there, Joel. Where are you coming from, Joel? Where are you based out of? Let us know. By the way, fun fact, Mo's been working with me for almost 10 years. You know, we got to give him like a 10-year anniversary gift or something like that because it's pretty powerful, pretty exciting stuff. He's, you know, he's running a lot of the back office stuff for our company. So if you guys don't know Mo, you get to know Mo. He's inside of Facebook. He's also inside of the Growth Collective, helping organize things. Technically speaking, helps facilitate and manage multiple team members. So thank you for calling out Mo there. And thank you for Mo for all your help as always, man. Um, okay, you guys on Facebook are being pretty quiet, you know, so again, I, I never know if it's Facebook throttling me back because of all the di different things we're doing, or if it's, you guys are just kind of listening in to see what goes on and just kind of take a backseat. It's all good. Well, 
let me go to the growth collective. Does anyone here have a particular scenario or a question before we dive into what I'm thinking about covering about distressed real estate, about renovations, about construction, right? There's a lot of different angles we can go here and topics we can talk about. Does anybody have anything that they want to bring up that I can address on the fly? I'm happy to do that with the, with the group. We got Los Angeles, Goodwin Yee, welcome. He's on Facebook. Excellent. So we do, we are getting, we are coming through on Facebook, which is great. Just a little slow. It's all right. We'll, we'll let you guys slide. So let me preface this. Maybe I should talk a, a little bit about my experience and I will give you some context so you guys can have some idea of what I could cover with you as far as distressed real estate. So collectively, JDL Ventures has wholesaled, which is basically the contract flipping process where we enter into a contract for, to buy real estate and we have the we're the principal in the transaction we put a deposit down to buy the property and we have the rights to buy the property we have the capacity to buy the property but then we decide through a process of bringing it to some investors and in some cases a lot of investors in our network that we want to sell the opportunity to someone else to take over and so we've done that wholesale contract flipping a couple hundred times a little more than a couple hundred times actually um, over the past almost decade and it's it's an honor to share that with you i remember working on my first deal and how much it was, how challenging it was, and how much it was frustrating, and how much you know time I invested, and how much money I was investing in the marketing, all kinds of stuff. So, part of what I do, as far as you know, serving you all here and also inside the Growth Collective, is really to bring awareness and understanding around that process to acquire real estate successfully, and ultimately monetize it as far as either wholesale flipping, fixing and flipping, or keeping as a rental, or doing a little bit of all that. I've got experience doing all those things and some more than others. Uh, fix and flip, for example, our company has fixed and flipped about 50 properties over the past probably six or seven years. Uh, a lot of times we work with partners that manage construction or that bring capital into a deal. So if you're looking to get involved in a project and you're curious what we have going on, feel free to hit me up. Uh, I'd love to talk with you more about what you're working on. We, at any given time, have a couple of different things we're looking at. On the wholesale side, we have probably about three or four opportunities right now that I know are in, in process of being purchased that we can ultimately sell the deal. A couple are in Florida, maybe one or two up in New Jersey, New York area. So let me know about that if that's something that's interesting for you. And if you're looking to get into um, a project together in some capacity, let's just have a conversation. Like I just told my clients last night, you know, it's not about pitching you a deal or pitching you the need to bring capital. That's not what we're doing here. This isn't a solicitation for your funds. This is an opportunity for us to get to know each other, right? To get to know each other and how we can work together, how I can help you, how you can help me, how you can help the community of clients and people in this group that are looking to do deals all across the country. So just let's get connected. Let's get a chance to know each other. Let's get a chance to see if we like working together. Let's see if we can find a way to work together profitably and trust the process to get real estate done. Basically, that's what it comes down to. So I know I've got friends of mine in this group. I got people I've done business with. If you guys are hearing me right now, do me a favor and shout yourself out. That'd be awesome. And let me know, you know, that you're here. I know a couple of my buddies up in college from college and stuff are still up there and I've done some business with a couple of them. So they're in the group here. I know I got friends in real estate as well. So appreciate you guys being here if you're listening in. Keith is coming in from Florida and Keith's got, uh, he's it's Keith Bozeman sells homes. So that's cool. I like that. And um, yeah, so that's awesome. So my experience, again, wholesale, fix and flip. And then we move into buy and hold. I just gave an example today about a multifamily, a two family property that we owned my wife and I owned up in New Jersey, uh, owned with an ED at the end, uh, owned, right? <laughs> Don't take that one out of context. You know, let's not even go there. So I got to be funny sometimes. I try to have some sense of humor. My wife's going to kill me probably, but it's all right. So owned, right? We owned that property. We bought that property. We renovated that property. We ended up uh, placing tenants and refinancing that property. And, and then what we've done is since we've actually sold that property. Now, hindsight's 2020, but Part of the challenge, part of the discussion today actually has to do with some of the challenges we faced in that particular property, but also around properties that were happening, renovations that were happening, and intensity and pressure that was happening at that time in my real estate investing career, so to speak, that made it feel like the right move, plus the market, what was going on then. Believe it or not, in 2018, 2019, that was a time when we started seeing you know, a lot of people saying that we were coming towards the end of a cycle because of statistically how many years had passed before you know there was an adjustment. So now look forward, you know, five more years with COVID. Some people say COVID reset the market. Some people say it's going to cause issues still. The market's going to have a correction. Money's more expensive. There's so many questions and confusion out there. I don't have all the answers. I'm not here to say I'm like a, a guru or something like that. I, I'm not that. I'm just here to help bring some visibility and awareness and hopefully some understanding to some of my experiences that can maybe impact you a little bit 
And then you can go out there and use it how you see fit or don't use it, but it's totally on you to decide. You know, we take no responsibility, obviously. I, I should say that more often than what you decide to do. I can only encourage you as someone listening to this, obviously my clients, we have a relationship working together. We want to help you in every way possible. We possibly can. We get to know you like as if you're, you know, on the team or working right alongside of us. And that's that's on that's on purpose. Um, folks in the group here, I don't really get to see you or talk to you the same way. So if you kind of want that more intense and more uh, deliberate and more intentional focus, again, join the growth club, get some information, find out if it's a good fit. And if it's not, no sweat, you can still come into this meeting every single week. We're here for you. So buy and hold though, you know, at that time, it was a two family in a, a place called Boundbrook, New Jersey, central New Jersey. And so that particular town, just to give an example, you know, is probably about 50-50 owner occupied to tenant occupied property, meaning that there's like 50% of the market there has like landlord properties, right? There's a good amount of properties to potentially buy or potentially, you know, if you're a landlord, you can keep those properties and rent them out. This particular property was on like a dead end street, great location, everything like that. Like if you're interested, we could talk more specifically, just hit me up on a direct message or something. We'll talk about the deal if you want, or maybe we'll do a presentation on it sometime. But the fact of the matter is that it was an auction property, right? Auction property. So we had actually one of our coaches, Coach Lewis, he was here, I think, last week uh, in our what we call our power hour. He was talking about acquisition strategies. He's got thousands, literally thousands of deals that he's done. No exaggeration um, as an investor, but also as an agent, helping other investors all across the country and actually training people in the auction process and the sheriff's sale process. This was not a deal from Lewis, but it was a deal from the same kind of process that we acquired from a relationship of a guy that was actively buying through auction. He was wholesaling it. So he actually closed on the property. And then the same day, he sold us the property. It's called a double close. And that's perfectly legal, um, at least in the state of New Jersey. Again, I don't know every single state. You got to check with your local state stuff. But um, I happen to know that in New Jersey, you could do a double close or otherwise called a simultaneous close, so long as there's no provisions around you not being able to do that with whoever you're buying the property from. And there's all different stuff. We're not here to talk about that. It's a title question. We could help you with that separately, but that's not today. Fact is, I bought that property. It was in distress. So that's like the example I want to start with today as we're kind of gathering, getting people to think about their questions, maybe uh, the property, you know, one side, one unit was probably, uh, I'll call it lived in. It wasn't horrible. It was probably about 15 or 20K worth of cosmetic updates. It was a two bedroom with a walk-up attic on both sides. <laughs> and basically, you know, um, probably about 27, 2,800 square feet total on this, this structure um, was a side-by-side -side duplex. Now, in that project, right, we went into it and someone that I trusted, which I, you know, still do business with today, uh, went through the property with me who does construction. He went through the property, he walked it, he said, look, you probably got about 15 over here. You probably about 20 on this other side because of some other stuff we have to do. And then it looks like the roof might need to get redone and we might need to do some cleanup. So we kind of estimated about 50K-ish of work to do, right? Probably sounds familiar if you're doing renovations, you're doing fix and flips, you're doing renovations to keep property. You kind of have this initial, you know, assessment this initial scope of work, as I call it, the development of that scope of work, what are we going to do, right? We're going to talk about what we're going to do. And then we're going to say, well, it's probably going to cost about this much. That's the budget. So first thing is, if you're taking notes, figure out what the what's are, right? I know this is a little bit different than like what I coach on when it comes to, you know, figuring out a solution, because usually you want to think about who can help me solve this, not what is it I had to do. But when you're literally buying a property, right, and you're in the process of purchasing property, you got to say, what do we have to do to maximize the value of this property? What do we have to do to add equity to this property? What do we have to do to create a spread, as we would call it, in this property? So what work can we do that's going to be a strong return on investment of that work, of that money we're going to spend to do that work? I would even say that it's not really an expense, right? I want you all to think about this. I want you to change your thinking a little bit that usually, if you do it right, which it's easy to not to do it right as well, it's, it's, it's sometimes more difficult to do it the right way, but it's you got to go into it, planning it out, right? Um, it's not an expense as much as it's an investment. What I mean is when you think about spending money, you're actually investing money on that property. So when we bought this property, we saw the scope of work, what had to be done. And we said, well, I could rent this property out the way it is kind of, I could fix some stuff that's broken and then just slap it together and be done with it. Or I could say, no, you know what? The best thing to do because it's gonna be a rental property is actually figure out what's messed up and go there and actually fix it now and also fix the stuff that's going to get messed up or fix the stuff that's old to make it new. So when you look at that, you want to think about what to do, the scope of work. So we shorthand that to SOW, scope of work. Distressed real estate, as in physical distress, is always going to have some type of scope of work. Okay. I'm talking to my wholesalers now. If you guys are in the room right now and you wholesale deals, if you're a wholesaler, 
do me a favor, drop a comment or drop even inside the chat on Zoom. If you're looking to wholesale or have done wholesale before, drop the word wholesale because I'm talking to you right now next. I want to wait a second and see what we have in the room. Is anybody listening to me that wholesales real estate right now? I know we have a couple of folks in the Zoom room that's either looking to do that or have done that. Wholesale. All right, we also have Wendy from Canada in the room with us in New Brunswick, Canada. Welcome, Wendy, again. Okay, I know we have folks here, but you guys are just being real quiet today. That's okay. So when you're looking to wholesale flip, right? We have one person, Alicia's here looking to wholesale up in New Jersey. Alicia is one of our clients. Joe is actually on Facebook. Thank you, Joe, for commenting and for being participative. Uh, Joe is another gentleman that we've done some business with uh, down in South Jersey. So he's got a lot of experience in construction and he's also got a lot of deal flow. So definitely connect to Joe. And Joe, I'd love the opportunity to see what you're up to these days, man. I know it's been a little bit since we spoke and we've connected. So let's see if we can set up some time sometime. But Joe... Joe is down there in South Jersey. Joe understands construction. So Joe's got what I call an unfair advantage, all right? Joe knows construction. So he knows the scope of work development. He knows the budgeting process. He knows the execution of that work. He knows how to coordinate schedules and how to deal with payments and how to handle subcontractors. I know that because I know Joe. But most of us here are not Joe, right? I mean, we're not like that. We don't have those traits. So we have to rely on folks like Joe, right? Like a contractor that we trust, that we've sourced and hired for this particular job to do the work. But see, as a wholesaler, I want to do a quick shout out to Jenny and Glenn. I see you there. You guys haven't done one yet, but you're working on it. So that's like, you've done more than that. You've actually bought property that has been rental property and also fix and flip. So that's even better. So not nothing against my wholesale friends. We did a couple hundred of those. So I get that. But it's also kind of cool when you actually see the project hands on, you fix it up, you sell it, you fix it up, you keep it, you just get a good deal. But for the wholesale people in the room, okay, this isn't just about fixing up and flipping houses. I want to think about this. If you're a wholesaler or looking to wholesale, I'm going to give you a couple of tips here, two or three tips that are going to help you maximize your wholesale fee. If you want to take your wholesale fee from $5,000 or $10,000 and multiply it to 15, 20, or 30K on average, who's interested in doing something like that? Who's interested in multiplying their typical spread on a wholesale deal? I think everybody should say I'm interested in that. I'm pretty sure that if you're not interested in that, then I'm really not sure respectfully why you're sitting in this room because that's kind of the process. We're trying to help you multiply your income, not just add to it, right? We're trying to maximize the opportunity here. So if you're looking to multiply it as a wholesaler, then let me know that. I see Janet's in the room here on, on the Growth Collective. She's saying I am and Alicia is as well. Just comment and goes there again. E excellent. So if you're looking to multiply, I'm going to give you a tip right now, a very simple one. It takes a little bit of work but I promise you it's gonna pay off, okay? I need you to do me a favor and write down these words on your piece of paper. Sherry's with us, Jasmine, Wendy, everybody. I mean, it's just no brainer. I am a buyer. Why don't you write that down another time? I am a buyer. Don't ever define yourself as a wholesaler. right? I'm gonna upset some people in this room in terms of my Facebook group. I know I am, because they're like, man, but you're talking so direct, you're being so clear about this, you're being so prescriptive or something like, yeah, you know what, but that's intentional, because I made that mistake. The in the beginning, I see Pavelos here, what's up, man, how you doing? I, I thought of myself, when I literally went to networking events, and I shook people's hands, first off, it's kind of a funny story. But my first probably year, year and a half in the business, I would literally wear a suit. That was my thing. I was the guy with the suit on. I didn't wear a tie, but I wore a suit with an open collar shirt. Because I wanted to show the professionalism that I felt like I brought from being in corporate for almost a decade before I got into real estate investing. That was my vision for myself. I'm going to be the guy that's the professional real estate investor. But sometimes I, I introduce myself as the professional wholesaler. And what happens is if you have a level of respect from other peers in the business that starts, let's say, at a normal base of like average, okay? People are like, oh, who's this person? There's Jasmine. There's Alicia. There's Wendy. I see you. Okay. There's Jenny and Glenn. Cool. They're just in the same room as me, and they're going to come up and shake my hand and say, hello, pass me a card. As soon as you say that I'm a wholesaler, I hate to break it to everybody, but this is real. Your respect is going to be dropped to like three or four levels beneath where it started initially. And why is that? Here's another thing. A PSA for my wholesale friends. Stop doing it the wrong way. I want to help you. Okay. I learned this the hard way. I wasn't properly positioning myself in the business and properly positioning the deals that I had that were available to me to purchase, the properties that I could buy, the deals that I could help someone else sell as a joint venture. There's a whole nother 
bunch of stuff we could talk about that we don't have on the schedule today. And I'm happy to share that with you. If you guys are interested in virtual wholesaling and you want a free 15 minute masterclass, literally giving examples of how I and my company have done that successfully, just hit on, um, on Facebook, just put in um, virtual. Virtual is the easiest one. As I already said, wholesale, I think. Just put in the word virtual. If you're in the growth collective and you haven't seen that yet, you got to see that video. So just hit us up on Slack inside your private Slack, put the word, hey, or just say, we're looking for a virtual. I need the virtual masterclass. You could do this business virtually from anywhere, basically almost to anywhere, but there's some stipulations about laws. You need to make sure you're following state and local laws, of course. And the process needs to be buttoned up. But here's the thing. The way I was able to do that is because I transitioned from being the professional wholesaler to being the professional investor, to being the buyer. I am the buyer. See, because a true wholesaler, a true wholesaler is able to access inventory, distressed property, distressed situations, pressure, you know, or unwanted property, all those different lead types that we talk about. If you follow anything in, in this space about types of properties you could buy, things you could do with real estate. But the thing is, a lot of folks that are attempting to wholesale are doing it in, entirely incorrect. And what I mean is, you're somebody said, I have this property that I'm looking to sell. Can you buy it? And you're like, yeah, I'll buy it for this number that I have no idea if it's the right number. I don't know how to analyze deals. I'm just going to put it under contract and hope and pray that someone pays me $10,000 more than what I have under contract for. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Like, I mean, come on, isn't that something that we've seen? We might have done it or been around that. Okay, that's real. It's just me being straight up with you guys. Like, that's not the right way. So what we need to do is go back to the words, I am a buyer. Okay, and let's, let's, exa let's exaggerate that a little bit. Like, I must buy this property. I must buy this property. When you think about wholesaling, I need you to say, I must buy this property. Because a wholesaler really has the responsibility to the seller, if you're going direct to a seller, to close on the property. You have a contractual right and, a, and reason to close. You're committing to buy someone's real estate and have a responsibility to honor that commitment and close on the property. If you cannot honor that, then you're not really in the business of real estate. You shouldn't be wholesaling. What you should do is find somebody that you work alongside of, whether it's somebody in the growth collective or somebody in our company or somebody else that you could work in conjunction with to help them sift and sort through deals that might be interesting for them. That's like working on a consultant basis or working on an acquisitions basis or something like that. That's going to help you. But here's where I'm going with this though. If you must buy the property, if that's the, if that's what it is, you're the wholesaler, right? And it's going to be, it's the most detailed part of this, just so you know, everybody. So I'm going to get to the distress part, but you're like, know where I'm going with this in a second. If you're the wholesaler, because a lot of people, that's like the fun thing to do. That's the exciting thing is you make five, 10, 20 grand really quick. It's quick cash. It's not get rich quick, but it's kind of like moving that direction. What we think about and see is like kind of some people think of it, you know, that's not the right way. Here's the right way. I must buy this property. Let me tell you something. If you must buy the property, then the next thing you need to write down is what must I know about this property so that I can buy the property? What must I know about this property so that I can properly purchase the property? How much information do I need to find out so that I can be in a position to buy this property? Okay. Here's the thing, in the context of this stress, in the context of this property is dilapidated, this property is falling apart, it needs some TLC, right? Who's, who's ever heard somebody say, this thing needs a little bit of cosmetic? If you just put the word cosmetic, it's just for fun. If you ever heard someone say cosmetic, how annoying is that sometimes? Like it just needs cosmetic, it just needs a little work, no big deal, right? Cosmetic, love that. All right, it can need cosmetic, but you know what's interesting? Cosmetic could be, a few hundred dollars to replace a few lights, or it could be $50,000 to do an entire remodel of a kitchen and a bathroom and the floor and the painting and the roof and the windows and the siding and everything else. So there's such a spectrum of what even someone calls quote unquote cosmetic that this creates a challenge, okay? The challenge is we have to, we must buy this property. If you're doing this the right way as a wholesale real estate investor, even as a, of course, as a fix and flip investor, but as a wholesale real estate investor, if you must buy this property, you must purchase it, then what must I know about it? Well, I must know the condition to the point where I can literally spend five, 10 or 15 minutes explaining to somebody else what's wrong with this property. Okay. It doesn't suffice to say it's cosmetically distressed. It needs cosmetic updates. That is not sufficient. Okay. Not at all. Don't do that. 
Okay. I know that's a little bit direct again. I was trying to be kind of funny, but kind of not funny. It's like, this is serious. If you're the buyer, you must close. You're going into contract. What must you know about the property to properly purchase the property, to profitably purchase the property, to prepare a lot of P's, P words here, prepare to position yourself to sell that deal. See, like acquisitions, it's lead generation, number one. Number two is deal analysis. Number three is negotiation. Number four is getting into contract. Whether you're a wholesaler, you're a fix and flip investor, you're a buy and hold investor, you're whatever you want to call yourself kind of investor, you're a private real estate investor, I don't, whatever you consider yourself to be, we all need to understand the acquisitions process. And in acquisitions, as even a wholesaler, what some would say respectfully, because I've I have a company that does this, I understand it, are the lowest totem, lotus on the totem pole, if you would call it that, right? They're like kind of getting started a lot of times. They're brand new. They don't know what they're doing. Don't go for that. Be the opposite. Know so much about the property that someone says, wow, I just see Norma came in. What's up, Norma? How you doing? Norma's down there in Texas. Norma, I know Norma's going to know everything because I know how Norma operates. Norma's going to say, I know everything. I could literally go to this house, get my friends and get some you know, food and drink and hang out and do the work on this property. That's how Norma thinks that I know Norma. Because Norma is deliberate and intentional and, and thorough. And that's awesome. And Norma is also a decision maker. She's like, I either want to buy this or I don't want to buy this. And she's willing to say, I like this or I don't like this. That's another part of it. But the fact is, Norma can't decide whether she's going to put this property in a contract unless what? Unless she knows what the condition is. Unless she knows what to do, what could go wrong, what could go right. And check it out. Once we know the what's, what do you think is next? It's what to do. And then the question is dollar amount, how much? Let me ask you something. When's the last time that you bought something that you didn't know what you were buying? When's the last time you ever bought something that you had no idea what you were buying? When was the last time that you bought something that was used, that someone else used for more than a day and you just said, I'll buy it? And then there was no inspection, no due diligence. You just took whatever they gave you and said, here's the money. That just doesn't happen, right? This is not a smart business decision, okay? I'm your friend, I promise. I'm trying to help you guys. Don't do that. So if you're negotiating on, let's say, Facebook Marketplace, like a lot of my friends, and we also buy and sell stuff on Facebook Marketplace, furniture outside, whatever's going on, like stuff that just like random stuff. We donate a lot of stuff too, but sometimes it's stuff that's in pretty good shape that we think maybe we can get a couple bucks for, you know? I'm going to describe the thing that I'm selling. And then the person that's going to buy it is usually going to do what? They're going to ask me questions. Okay, so I want you to write this down. What questions must you ask about the condition? What questions or what, what questions must I ask about the condition? I want you all to do me a favor inside of Facebook to start because my growth collective friends have like an advantage here that's, you know, a little bit beyond uh, and it's also, I can see it faster because it's inside the Zoom. So I'm going to give the first chance to the Facebook community here. Give me some things that you've seen having to be done on property. Give me some examples of work that has to get done. Give me a scope of work description of maybe one item. What do you think is the most common thing that has to be done? Here's a pop quiz. Every property that you buy, with the exception of brand new construction, needs this thing done. And I see there's already a that was really fast on the growth button. Thank you, Sherry. You get a brownie point for that. What is something that everything, every single property that trades, except for brand new construction, you have to do this to the property. It's like a must. There's a couple of them you can choose from. Dylan says, if they were buying, what would they rate the condition? One to 10. I like that question, Dylan. So Dylan is on Facebook. He's saying that if he's talking to a seller, he asked the question, if you were buying this property, what would you rate the condition? One to 10. That's quantitative. I like that. Now we got to get to the detail though. One level deeper. Okay. We got good ones saying paint. That's great. That's, that's one I was looking for. So painting, right? Well, Doug, what about a rental property? Okay. Are you looking to get below market rent, at market rent or above market rent? Like make that decision, right? Cause you're trying to buy distressed real estate to rent out. Let's say you're not going to paint the place. You're going to put tenants in with smelly, disgusting looking walls. I doubt that you're going to paint the whole place. Even if you paint it white, paint it something, make it look fresh. Okay, that's And then Joe, another brownie point. I want to give you guys something for free. So I don't know what that is yet, but we're going to come up with it. Let's track who's answering these things correct. So we got Goodwin. We got Joe. I like Dylan's answer. I like Sherry's answer. So if the team, the growth of the team can kind of track this, we got something going to uh, Dylan. We got something going to Goodwin. I don't know what that something is yet, but we're going to figure it out. 
Joe and also Sherry and also Glennie and Jenna. See, you put your squatter house. That's good. I like that one too. Made me laugh. It's hopefully that's going well. Hopefully, I don't know what's going on there, but we'll check in on that soon. So Joe says, clean, clean. Interesting, right? So are you going to give somebody a dirty property to live in? That's like, ridiculous, right? Like we're not going to do that. So it's cleaning it and, and painting it probably first, actually, because why? We're going to have painter's tape if we're doing it the right way. We might have a couple of splashes of paint on the floor or on the windows or on somewhere else in the property that, you know, the countertop or something. <clears throat> we got to clean this place, all right? The deep clean is what you want to consider if you're flipping the house, probably if you're renting the place. But those are two things right off the bat that are going to be done on pretty much every property. And then Goodwin says, another bonus point for Goodwin, flooring. Flooring, okay. Look, you know what LVP is? Let's talk about LVP, luxury vinyl plank. You know, when I told my wife, I love my wife, she's probably here listening maybe, or maybe some. I see my mother-in-law's on here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we call her Tati, so that's uh, the kids call her, that's that's in the culture, right? We're Middle Eastern and uh, that's that's what we call my mother-in-law. So I know Tati knows this too, right? So it's like, it's not rocket science that you might want to consider getting some new floors. LVP. If you can see it all my floor a little bit, you kind of can, if I scooch back, this here is LVP. LVP is usually like four to eight inches wide planks that are vinyl that have a look typically like a wood, like a hardwood. And, and what happens is these manufacturers basically make it to where they literally go tongue and groove and it's what's called a floating floor, right? And so that means you don't have to do a lot of stuff beneath the floor. You might want to put down some type of membrane depending on the insulation where you're putting it but you can go right on top of tile too you can go right on top of hardwood in the house that i'm sitting in right now we did all new lvp for almost 3,000 square feet of a house and total cost is just shy of like 10 grand so to give you kind of perspective like and that's like a decent lvp it's nothing high end it's like three dollars a square foot but it looks really really nice and it's brand new but inexpensive fixes right painting it varies but it's going to be inexpensive cleaning is like super cheap like, why wouldn't we do these things? We would. That's the point. We would do them. So these are musts. Okay. Sherry loves LVP. Christina loves LVP. LVP is getting some love today. It's good. I can't pronounce it. Is it Ilana? Lance, uh, Ilana, I think, or Ilana. I can't tell. It looks like an L, I think. Thank you for commenting. So landscaping front and back curb appeal. <laughs> Heather says, reseal the tubs and sinks. So we're going to talk about some of these items, but again, add Heather and Ilana, if I said your name correctly, to the list of giving away something for free team on Facebook. You can see their names right there. And also Christina. What's up, Christina? Great stuff. I love the engagement. That's I'm trying to encourage you all to be engaged because that's important. Important to stay plugged in. Whether It's not just because I'm saying it. It's just for the sake of your growth and learning and your improvement. And like people see your name. Like people say, oh, wait a second. Heather knows something about resealing tubs and sinks. Maybe she's also a real estate investor that I want to connect with, right? They hear Sherry's name, like, who's this lady Sherry Doug keeps on saying? Well, maybe they look in the group and they say, there's Sherry Terryberry. I better connect to her down in, in Texas or Norma down there in Texas or somebody else in the group. Like, they're hearing names and that's going to help you guys get connected, right? You don't have to know everything. You just don't know who to talk to that has this, this information. So let's talk about resealing tubs and sinks for a second. I know that in New Jersey, I think we resealed probably a handful of tubs, like and more like rental properties, right? So what happens is the tub is ceramic, right? We'll say it's like a sitting soaking type of tub. It's it's the kind that's like in the wall next to the shower area. It's not like a standalone tub type of thing. It's like installed against the wall with with tile that goes up the ceiling, up to not to the ceiling, but up to like you know the wall, and then basically where the where the shower head comes out and where the spigot comes out. So in that scenario, did you know? Fun fact: you could basically reseal or actually glaze this, this entire tub and this tile around it all white for sometimes like half or less than what it would cost to take out the tub, put in new tile, put in new tub and all that stuff. You don't need to do all that. So a quick hack, that right there could have saved you a thousand bucks, 2000 bucks easily on a bathroom refinishment. Cause you could basically have a person come in and get this glazing material, which is very like sticky and very like not something you want to work with unless you're like a contractor and knows it. But you hire someone to do this for like 800 bucks to a thousand bucks for a tub and a shower surround. And now you have what appears to be a brand new shower area and it costs you like a thousand max, 2000 bucks. So that's a really good tip right there, actually, of doing that uh, glazing of tubs. If you're in New Jersey, and I haven't talked to this gentleman in a while, but if you're in New Jersey, you need a contact. I might even have somebody 
because we had him use, you know, we used him on a few different properties. And I know a lot of investors in New Jersey use him in Northern New Jersey. So if you need that contact, just hit me up and I'll do my best to find his name and get you guys connected. I like Ilana's answer to landscaping, right? So what are we doing right now? Let's take a pause. We're developing a scope of work in a hypothetical property. And we're talking about stuff that's applicable to most properties, if not all properties, right? Like if we're not going to reglaze the dirty old looking beat up ceramic style tub with towels that are maybe not looking great, grout that's ugly, you could clean the grout if it's able to be done. There's sometimes you just clean the grout, you have a company come and do that. But you could also just go right on top of it. And so basically, what are we saying though? Cosmetic, I'm gonna talk about landscaping in a second. Cosmetic updates pretty much are universally accepted as required on every property that's trading hands or that you're gonna put a tenant into. I would say like, you'd be leaving money on the table by not updating it cosmetically. You would basically be saying, I'm okay getting less than the market value for either the sale or the rental because you're not saying you're lazy, but we're being a little lazy about not doing the work we need to do. Like that's kind of what's going to happen. So you might as well, if you could just fix up those things cosmetically, obviously it's going to help improve the value. It may not give you a bump of like a hundred grand, but it's going to give you a bump for sure. Now we talked about LVP, quick comment on that too. Like LVP can be purchased at Lowe's and Home Depot, right? You don't have to order it from a supply shop. Um, you could also, same thing with um, paint. You could buy paint from a regular hardware store. There's a difference, obviously, between labor and materials. And so quick little tip for you, if you want to work on a budget and you're and you're comfortable kind of taking a little bit more time, you want to invest the time to break this out, go on to Lowe's or go on to homedepot.com or make a connection. Better yet, get set up as a pro if you're actually renovating property and go to the pro desk or whatever they call it. I forget which one's a pro desk, which one's the other. The other it's like the same thing. But one of them calls a pro desk, one of them calls it something else. You go there and you say, hey, I'm in business. Here's my EIN number. Like, obviously, you have to have an LLC. You have to have a company. You have an EIN number. And they'll give you a program where, like, at Lowe's, it's called the QSP, a QSP, a discount program, where they basically say, everything that you're buying, we're going to, right off the top, take, like, 10, 15, 20% usually off the top. So that right there probably saved their companies, like, tens of thousands of dollars. I don't have the exact number. Just on having that alone. But we bought probably 20 or 30 appliance packages through Lowe's. We've also bought appliances through Best Buy with a connection we had at Best Buy. So it goes down to say, like, you got to think the things that people can see with their eyes. If the property is distressed, we're talking about the easy stuff right now. You know, like you got to do the easy stuff. You got to paint. You got to do the flooring, in my opinion, right? Like other people could argue this. You could look at the numbers, but paint. Uh, you know, flooring, you got to clean the place, obviously, but you also want to do the updates to the kitchen. We'll get into some more kitchen stuff in a second, the bathrooms. And you got to think like, where can I save a little bit of money so I could do this, you know, inexpensively? Material costs are going to be less expensive when you have things like the pro desk, for example, when you have a supply shop, but you may not have the buying power. Let's say you're, not, you're just buying one thing. You're buying one kitchen or buying for one house. Like you may not get a tremendous incentive if you go to like a supply shop, you're just going to kind of pay like average. You're not going to get anything crazy. But you start buying like five, 10 things at a time, that's a different story. Labor, on the other hand, okay, let's talk about labor. Okay, this is very, very important. No, this is the stressed real estate stuff. And let me go back to my initial thing about wholesaling. Where am I going with the wholesale model here? Why is wholesale part of the distressed real estate conversation? Because I want to say a PSA right now that I encourage, I implore, in fact, I want to help support the community of wholesalers or soon to be wholesalers in this group and beyond this group to understand that it just takes a little bit of work to develop a scope of work and a budget to help you multiply your wholesale fee. And how do I know that? Because I've literally done that in our companies. I've seen it firsthand. I can show you examples. I'm giving you some of those examples now. See, when I can say to somebody else who's just like me as a buyer, because I'm a buyer, you're a buyer. If you, if you decide to be a buyer, you're a buyer. If you have the capacity to buy, you have, you have to have the capacity, of course. You have to know how to buy you have to know what to buy. You have to know how to borrow money potentially or invest capital. But ultimately, if you understand that we're all sitting here as buyers of real estate, not just a wholesale, I'm just going to flip a contract that I think I know kind of what it is. No, I need to know everything. I need to know the scope. I need to know the condition and scope work. I need to understand what's this going to cost me and how can I bring value to who? How can I bring value? Fill in the blank. Who am I bringing value to as a wholesale real estate investor? Who's the next person in line? We got some good comments going on. I'm gonna catch that up in a second. Just who am I bringing value to as a wholesaler? Who is my client? Who wants to jump in? Anybody on TGC Growth Collective? Who's gonna Who's gonna take over? That's a hint. You guys know this. Come on now. The end buyer, right? That's what people call it. 
Me. I love that, Alicia. Very good. I like the answer. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna flip this opportunity, this deal to somebody else, the investor, the buyer that takes over this right to buy the property from us. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that the less information, everybody, as a wholesale real estate, the less information that you have that's required to make a buying decision, that's very important. Write this down. If I don't have all the information needed to make a buying decision, the question is who is gonna find that out? And how long is it going to take? And how much value are you not providing by getting that information? So like literally, if someone sends me an address, like, hey, Doug, I heard about this property at 123 Main Street in Sarasota. You interested in buying it? I'm like, well, maybe. I need some more information. I don't have any more information. Okay, well, who can I talk to that has more information? Um, I'm not really sure. I, can, okay, can you get me on the phone with the seller? Like, I don't understand. That's not wholesaling. That's and again, I say this respectfully. I'm just being real. I'm always as authentic as I possibly can be, but I need to shake you guys up a little bit. There's a place for that. There's a place for the referral of an address. That's what most people would call. It's not really derogatory, but some people frown upon it. It's called a bird dog. It's a referral, right? It's like, yeah, I heard about this property over there that somebody looks like they're not taking care of it and it needs to be sold probably. So you want to check it out? That doesn't qualify you to make five, 10, 20 grand on a deal, in my opinion, right? You guys can argue that all day. But for me, it's not earned. It's not like special. Like you drove around, you saw a house that has high grass and you put it into a system and said, that property is not on the market. Let me go tell someone about it. That's not what wholesaling is. That's not what real estate is. It's just a property. It's like, hey, I, I heard about this thing. It's like, uh, you heard about that TV thing? You heard about that movie? You heard about, it's like, Nobody really gets paid for that. It's like, hey, I know that this is a really good deal because fill in the blank. Condition is X, Y, Z, A, B, C. I think it's going to cost them. Hey, better yet, check this out. I coach my clients on this too inside the growth method. Join the growth method.com. This is a tip I literally told at least two or three people in one-on-ones the other couple of days ago. You want to find the person that could do the work as a wholesaler. Find the person that could literally pick up their stuff, their tools, and get their guys together and go to the house and do the work. And literally just hand that contact without any, you know, responsibility of the work that gets done. You're not saying, hey, look, you're not saying I've used this person and meanwhile you have, that's not good business. I'm saying, here's somebody that has said they're in construction. I've taught them at least one or two times on the phone. They know the scope of work. They can see the pictures of the property because I've taken the time to figure that out. And they've given me a range of what it's going to cost. I say, look, here's Bob. He could do the work. He says it's going to cost about this much. Here's Bob's phone number. You know what's crazy? That takes probably about 15 to 20 more minutes and that can make you another 10 to 15 grand on a deal probably because people don't want to have to think about who do they call, who can do it, who can't do it. It's too difficult, as crazy as that sounds. So I just give you another piece of valuable information to go out there and make connections with contractors as a wholesaler and obviously as a fix and flip investor. The more connections you all make, the more business you will make. It's simple as that. The more people that you're connected to, if you intentionally connect and you think about the networks that you're creating, it's literally directly proportionate to the income you can create in real estate. So going back to the cosmetic, and I see some comments, I'm gonna call out some folks here. So um, <clears throat> let's see, we got a lot of good stuff here. So Keith says, make sure that you have a good sub for that with the professional refinished products, the spray can refinish is crap. So yeah, you I mean, you gotta have somebody who knows what they're doing, somebody that specializes in that, somebody that has testimonials or referrals of previous customers, if it's something like that specific. Good point. I like that, Keith. Get Keith something for free, whatever. I don't, think, I don't know if you got one already, but he'll get one for sure. And then Ilana, again, thank you, Ilana. Cut the high grass, pull the weeds. Like obvious, right? Like let's take care of the stuff in the landscape and that's just distressed and looking ugly. We want to make it look beautiful. Throw down some mulch, plant a couple plants, right? Spruce it up a bit. Maybe put some sod down, put some stone down. Do something that's going to make it look a little bit nicer from the curb appeal perspective, even the backyard, right? People want to hang out in their backyard and feel comfortable. They don't want to look at like dirt that's like grass is growing some part here and over here is a bunch of dirt and then it's like muddy or it's wet or whatever. Like you just fix that. Like think about that's going to be done. We can't uh, avoid that. It's something that has to get done. Heather says, Costco has great 20 mil LVP for like $3 a square foot. That's really good actually. So just make sure it's LVP and not Pergo. Okay. Not, and I'm not like a expert of this difference, but I'll tell you it's different for sure because LVP has a different, it's vinyl and it's got the sub part of it is like a rubberized type of thing. Ergo is more like compressed, like MDF, which is basically like essentially, um, you know, uh, recycled paper, essentially consolidated and pressed. 
And if that gets wet, if Pergo gets wet, typically it's not going to be waterproof versus LVP is going to be waterproof or at least water resistant. And it's going to be very durable. Okay. So <clears throat> I think you guys hopefully can hear that I've got some experience running construction. We've literally had tens of millions of dollars in construction that we've managed across our projects. And I've you know coached probably tens of millions more people like as far as construction projects. So Christina, Christina says that's super cheap. I bought six mil with cork back. There's like cork backing right there for 350 a square foot. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So just double check that. That sounds really good, but just be careful. Okay. And we got Heather says, yes, you can, you have to go in and pick on what's on the floor, but Costco usually has a couple of uh, colors to choose from. Excellent. And then Tyler, I think you were saying about, you know, cast buyers, that's who's going next after us. So yeah, let's get, let's get Tyler something. Let's get Tyler a freebie. All right. Tyler's going to get a freebie from us as well for, for participating here. Sandy. Sandy says, Hey, all Charlotte, North Carolina, flipper, flipper. I think that's flipper. What's up, Sandy. Appreciate you being here. Feel free to continue to stay, you know, plugged in and engage. That's awesome. And then um, I love that you guys are going back and forth. That's awesome. In the comments, like it's, it's like a conversation, which is amazing. Uh, I, I think it's uh, Heather and Christina are going back. That's good. So that's exactly why we host this inside of a Facebook group. So you guys can connect and talk like this. And hopefully you take it into a messenger and it turns into a phone call and that turns into a Zoom. And the next thing you know, you're doing business. It's that's how it works. So Alana uh, and Byer, that's right. I think you already got something. So we'll, we'll make sure you get that. And then Heather says it's LVP, a promise. So excellent. Okay, good. So we got the point here about what to do as if you, you, were, you must buy this property. Like if you're going to go into contract, you got to buy it. So if from that perspective, perspective you need to get the information so if someone that's giving you the deal doesn't have the information it's it's almost like is it worth the time to go right don't be the people that are just like throwing stuff out there and like wasting investors time because what's going to happen is my, my connection got a little weird here i think it's going to come back in a second it says unstable can you guys hear me okay we good all right I don't know what's going on. It must It's like, I always, the kids are in school, so it can't be the kids right now, but sometimes it's like, oh, are they using Netflix? Are they playing like Xbox, something like that? Like what's going on? Something, somebody's using bandwidth. I don't know. What, I got like, I think a gigabit or half of the gigabit at least. But anyway, so yeah, you want to know what you're going to do. And then you got to figure out what it's going to cost. And then I said, the bonus is who can do it. Write that down. Tell me right now. It's so valuable. Who can do the work? Hey, Doug, I was, that was sound great, but like, I don't have any contractor connections. Where can I find some people? How do I find contractors? I'm going to ask you guys, where do you find contractors? Who knows the, feel free to, you know, growth collective, feel free to put it in the chat and Facebook. Of course, you guys have the answers. A lot of you have the answers already. You're just not sharing those answers because you feel whatever you feel. You know, there's a lot of folks in this room on both the Zoom and the Facebook group that have a tremendous amount of experience that could just help so many people and serve. And I feel like you're called to do that. If you feel like helping people out is a good idea, then, then I think you're onto something. That's a good idea, right? It's, it's, a it's a logical thing to do. And if you have experience, man, we'd love to host you as a guest inside the Gross Collective. If you're actually sitting here listening to me right now and you got some experience you want to share and you want to get a, a chance to be in front of a platform of my clients, let us know. We could look at hosting you as a guest. We'd love to learn more about your experience and see how you could help our group out as well. Um, Keith says cheap LVP will buckle in direct sunlight like when installed in front of a picture window. Quality products will show and get you more money. Right. So you got to balance out quality and cost. Okay. Here's another thing to write down, right? I learned this when I was working at Johnson & Johnson and I worked in project management. I worked in sourcing. I worked in IT. I worked in a lot of different things. Process excellence, Lean Six Sigma, all kinds of crazy things that are just like, what is that? Like, why is it? Is that really a thing? Yeah, it's, I'll tell you, there was a time when they had post-it notes. It sounds so nuts. Post-it notes on like this massive, like 30 foot wall that literally every post note represented a process step in this particular business process. And then it would take strings, like literally yarn, and they would connect it from one post note to another post note to show the connection of the process. And it was called Kaizen. Kaizen is like a Japanese style of basically process excellence or process improvement. And like, this is stuff that I was around. So it's just like wacky stuff that you don't really hear about a lot, but it just, so yes, you got to think though, there's a triple constraint. This is what I want you to write down, triple constraint. Look at Norma. I think Norma's in Home Depot right now. Is Norma in Home Depot? Look at you. That's awesome. Something, some hardware store, I think. Yeah. See her on top of the screen. It's like hilarious. That's awesome. So, you know, she's like, man, I heard, I, I get something from Lowe's or Home Depot. I could run out there. Let me go get that now. All right. So you got triple constraint. In project management, you have scope, which is the what. So write down scope equals what. Triple constraint says scope 
equals what? That's number one. It's triple, so it's three things. The second thing is how long? I didn't say how much yet. We're going to get in there, right? This third one's how much, but how long is it going to take to do the what? That's tough. We're going to come back to that. So we're going to go to how much. So what am I going to do? And then how much and how long? Those are the three things. So it's scope, budget, and time, or scope, time, and budget, however you want to think of it. Those three things are directly connected to one another. Effectively, if your scope increases, in other words, if you do more stuff, what do you think? Is the price going to change for the stuff to get done? Do you think you're going to pay more? You're not going to pay less. If you're doing more stuff, you're typically going to pay more, right? Wait a second. So what if I'm doing more work? Can I possibly do it faster? Well, maybe, but if you're doing enough more stuff, like if you're doing a significant amount of more work, I mean, it's likely you're going to take longer to get that thing done. So those three things are connected. There's all different you know, combinations of that, but the, the fact is it's scope, time, and budget. So when you're looking at you know, analyzing a distressed property, you must ask what, how much, and how long is it going to take? And if you don't have those three answers before you close on the property, I'm going to say that one more time. If you don't know what to do, the joke you guys call Ghostbusters, but we call, call the growth collective, we'll help you out. Now, if you, if you don't know what to do on the project, okay, you got to figure out what to do. That's an easy part. It's like, hey, show me some pictures. Let me go take a look at the property. I could pretty much, when my Regular, you know, non-experienced eyes tell what's messed up with this house or this building or this apartment. I could see that. If you then know what to do, the next thing is how long would it take to do this work? That's a difficult one to answer. I'll tell you, because that's going to be something that you have to get some details and data on. But how about how much? Hey, Bob, I know we got connected. I asked you guys a question, by the way, referrals. Referrals are great, yeah, for contractors, but... There's literally Facebook groups. Everybody, I can't emphasize enough how powerful Facebook can be for you and LinkedIn and all these other social media platforms if you use it properly for business. It's cool to post stuff about your family like I do. I post things about my wife, about me, about going vacation, stuff like that, and the kids. But you know what? There's so many connections being made that I'm making and that we're making as a company through Facebook alone. It's like absurd, but the, you could do the same thing. It's just a matter of being intentional. So it's like, hey, I need contractors, okay? You know the thing called Yellow Pages? That doesn't really exist. I mean, it might be at yellowpages.com, but the new Yellow Pages, it's actually social Yellow Pages. You know what that is? It's called a Facebook group. It's your local city-state buy-sell group or your local city-state referrals, word of mouth, mom's groups, pick a thing, any one of those. You know who makes the most referrals in real life? Man or woman, it is not like a any sort of discriminatory thing. It's like just factual. Like who is going to tell their friends more often about something that they enjoyed? Women do, right? My wife does. My wife's friends do. Like they talk about what they like, what they don't like way more than I talk about it. I tend to keep it to me for just for whatever. I tell my buddies, maybe a couple of them. I'm not telling the whole world. But a woman will go on, most women will go on to Facebook and share with everybody they know about an awesome experience and also tell people about how horrible it was. So if you're sitting here listening as a woman, right, and you're in those groups, you already have an advantage because you just got to listen and focus or be the one that puts it up there. And you're going to get like 10, 15, 20 people saying, hey, you should check out this guy, this gal, like they're doing great stuff. They did this for me in my house, my friend's house. Like it's easy to do it. And like literally within seconds or minutes, you're going to have answers. And if you're a guy, you know, I'm a guy, obviously, I, well, I shouldn't say that anymore. I hope you guys know I'm a man. I was born a man. I'll always be a man. I believe that there's an important thing about being a man. And being a woman, that's different, okay? Again, you guys can have a difference of opinion. No big deal. I'm not here to argue that. So it's just not my thing. I just, we're a whole different topic another day. We'll talk one-to-one -one or something. But I'm a man. I go into Facebook. I make a post in any of these groups. And I still get 5, 10, 15 people saying, well, I can know this guy, that guy. Go to this person, electrician, plumber, pool guy, this, that, that thing. It's easy to do it. So what are you waiting for? That answer the person that could do the work is literally going to help you make another 10, 15, 20 grand as a wholesaler. It's going to solve the problem for you to be able to fix up this property and sell it for a profit. It's right there at your fingertips. And yet we avoid it for some reason. Okay. Well, Doug, I don't know if I can get to the property. I can't get out to the house. I don't even know what I'm looking at. Hey, check it out. Call a few contractors. Hey, how you doing? This is Doug. Listen, I got a property I'm looking to buy. I'm gonna be buying it probably in the next few weeks here. I'm possibly working with some friends of mine to buy it with me. 
we're going to buy this property and we're going to renovate it. And we're looking to sell it. I was wondering, I see you're a contractor in XYZ city and state. I'd love to have a conversation about maybe working together. Could you do me a favor and maybe take a look at the property for me and tell me what you think it would cost to fix this up. And if it looks good, the numbers look good and everything checks out, I'd love to maybe consider you as the contractor to take on this job. Would that be, would that be something you're interested in? If that person is looking to grow their business, that you become a lead. So like, you're not hurting them. Like they could say, hey, I'm too busy. Or they could say, no, I'm ready to go look. Like, where do I go when? That's the kind of person I want to speak. Where do I go? What time am I going to be there? I'm going to go look at it. now. Someone could argue and say, because we got some people in the room that are obviously experienced, which is great. And I love that. I've been experienced enough to know that sometimes the people who are more available, here's another one. It's not as obvious, but I'm telling you guys, more available doesn't necessarily mean better. Doesn't necessarily mean higher quality of work, right? Remember I said scope before, right? Scope is one of the triple constraints. Scope is also related to quality, okay? So scope and quality are kind of connected at the top. If I draw it on a triangle, it's that the top part of the triangle, the apex, the top of it, scope and quality of work. And cost is also related as a <clears throat> contingent, if you would, on the quality. So you can get a job done, but just like I think Keith said it, you can do it the wrong way or have a contract to do it the wrong way. You can do it the right way. So, you know, I'll give you one quick example. Property in Northern New Jersey that we sold probably a year and a half or so ago. I can't remember which, which I think it was, I think it was at Summit, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> this one was a challenge. I had a few challenging projects to say the least. If you know me, we could talk again more about that. But if you don't know me, I just had a whole conversation with the clients about this and kind of share some stories so you guys understand. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. Things are not easy. It's a difficult business if you decide to take on responsibility to run renovations and, and, and sell properties or even just buy rentals. Like you have to manage that process. Even if it's not you doing the work, you still have to figure out a process to do that. So we talk about that in the Growth Collective extensively. We talk about the wins, but also the challenges. Fact is, I had this property that when we went to go sell it, there was, unbeknownst to me, there was a little couple of specks in the basement of like what appeared to be a mold-like substance, as they say, right? Because I don't, we can't say for sure. We didn't test it. It was mold-like substance. It wasn't from a flood. It wasn't from any water intrusion that was obvious. It wasn't like a leaking roof. It was just for whatever reason, you know, in the basement, in this like humid, you know, hot basement in the middle of summertime, whatever it was, there was a little bit of mold like substance. So when the buyer went to do their inspection, they said, Hey, we're not buying it. And they did the right thing. And I would encourage everybody here to do the same exact thing get your inspections when you're buying properties to keep 100%. If you're going to buy a property to fix and sell, yes, you can get an inspection. But here's another tip have the contractor that you're going to hire to do the work give them the responsibility to basically inspect it as part of their commitment to do the job. I don't need to pay them extra to inspect it. I want them to give me the awareness. Now, if there's environmental concerns, obviously I need to pay for that. If there's something that can't be seen, a structural thing that's beyond their kind of knowledge base or know-how, if they're just like a, a tradesperson, they're not really focused on it, then obviously you need to get an inspection. But in this case, this was part of the buyer's requirements of my end buyer to buy this property. And they did an inspection. They found what appeared to be something like mold or mold-like. Okay. Listen, set back a little bit, not the end of the world though. Why? Because I've dealt with it before. Here's a simple solution. Hey, I can do one of two things, at least two things, if not three or four. Would you rather have a credit for a few thousand dollars or whatever I think it's going to cost to fix the issue? A lot of times lenders don't want that though, because it's like too risky. What if it is mold? What if it spreads? They don't like that because environmental. That's not usually the case with a mold type of thing or something that's like mold or environmental, but you can still pose the question. But more than likely, 99 times out of 100, they're going to say, no, this is something that has to be addressed because it's structural, environmental, or safety. Those are the three things. Structural, environmental, or safety are typically required. Those three things for the deal to close with financing and also to get what's called a certificate of occupancy or whatever your local municipality calls the ability to stay in that property. So if it touches upon one of those three things, which this did, then the right thing to do most of the time is actually to fix the issue. Because I, I still own the property, right? And once I close, the way most contracts are worded is that there's no persistence responsibility for me of whatever might happen after we sell. So if that mold spreads and it creates a real issue and someone, God forbid, dies, it's not on me necessarily if my contract stays place, but I don't want that risk. So I want to address that. So what we did is we got bids. Two different contractors, as an example, there was more than two, but two of them came back. You know, what do you think this, I'm going to tell you this way. It was probably what I remember, it was probably like 10 feet worth of space that had to be inspected, like tested, and then remediated. 
What do you guys think the cost was to do that? What were the bids that I got? Give me some numbers. You want, I want you to guess and we'll wrap this up. And there's so much more to this, but we just don't have the time. But what do you guys think it cost or what do you think the bids were for 10 feet worth of mold inspection, uh, you know, testing and remediation? We got a 3K. Heather says 3K. Gabriel says 5K. Can I get a, can I get a seven? Can I get an eight? And I'm going to auction now. What do you guys think? Keep going. Is it lower or higher than five or three? That's a good range. Good guesses. I got a 5K, Alana. I got a 10K. How about this? If you guys give me at least one of the numbers, I'll give you a free book. I didn't write the book, but I'll give you a free book. Whether you're in the growth collective or you're just part of the group, I'll get you a free book. All we need to know is your address. So you're really close. Some One of the, per, one of the people that guess is very close. At least the, one, those two numbers I'm looking for. Sherry says 6K. Okay, we're going sort of the wrong direction, I would say, for the one number. And then we're really far away from the other number. So it's a pretty big range. Janet says 8K. All right, it's it's less than 5K for the one number, to give you a hint. So what's less than 5K that we've gotten guests so far? Okay, Christina, you get one of the, how'd you know that? 2,500 bucks, okay. Christina gets a book. What's the other end of the spectrum, guys and gals? It's above 10K. So the first bid that I got for the same exact the work was 2,500. Keith says that lack of airflow, easy to sanitize and encapsulate product-wise, less than 300 pros will probably charge about 3,500. Keith is an experienced investor, I can tell. I, want, I definitely want to get connected to Keith. We got to talk about how we can work together on some things. I like what you're saying, man. You're right. So about 3,500 and we it actually was the lowest was 2,500. That's one. That, that's like the answer. But what do you think the highest? That's even more fun. What do you think somebody had the audacity the audacity to tell me it would cost to do this little bit of remediation. Same exact scope of work, same property, same everything, exactly the same, you know, responsibility. After, you know, it's verified, warranty, whatever they do, report, all that stuff. 14K, I got 20K, Jasmine's getting closer, 15K. It's higher than 20K. Not much higher, but a little bit. Janice is 30K. Ilana says 12 point. This is fun. I want to do it. Can we do this every week? Like, I just love this. It's so fun. This is so cool. I feel like it's like the price is right or something. Jasmine says 22. Wendy says 22. Sherry's 22. Why are you guys all saying 22? That's so, that's so interesting. There's three 22s. You guys like talk about it or something like in the growth collective. We're like, we're close. It's right between 20 and 30. It was $25,000, literally 10 times. Like I have the bids to show it. $25,000. The one bid was, and the other one was 2,500. Okay. Here, if you if Jasmine, Wendy, or Sherry didn't already get a book, and I'll throw one in for Janet because she was pretty close. You guys, if you didn't already get a book, get a book. You get the Motivation Manifesto. The Motivation Manifesto was written by a guy named Brendan Burchard. Literally, that book was the tipping point beyond my early decision made for me to leave corporate. And I did that when I was in Costa Rica. And a fun fact was it was the first time I ever had a deal closed when I was out of the country on vacation. And I said, wait a second, what am I doing going to a cubicle every day? I need to be able to travel the world, invest time with my family, enjoy time with my family, make memories, and still make money when I'm in some other place. And I realized that, that was 100% possible because of that book. Because I reclaimed. And there you go. Glenn showing it. Hold on. I'm going to bring Glenn, Glenn and Jenny up real quick. Hold on. Show that again real quick. So show us that book. That's what it looks like right there. Okay. If you guys don't believe that there's actually people in a room sitting right now, let's do this. I'm going to, if, if I can get you on the screen, I don't know if it's going to work. That's my, this is my growth collective group. You guys wave, say hello. Come off video if you have a second. Everybody can see that you're actually real people that are sitting in a room in Zoom that have been here for almost an hour or more than an hour. Okay, excellent. So I don't know if you all can see them or not, but they're there. So there's about 10 or 15 people in the room. So bottom line is this stuff is interesting, right? But it's such a spread, if you would, of like range of price. So check this out. Here's the moral to the story is don't just take the first bid and take it for what it is because that 25K was one of the first that I got. And I said, that's not, that's not right. I said, this is too much. It's like literally 10 feet, 10 square feet of space. Like it's not really what, you know, oh, there you go. Yeah. I forgot to take off screen. It's, it's literally, sorry guys, I'm clicking the wrong thing. It's literally not, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, it's literally not, you know, just the one number that someone quotes and that's it. It's, it's not like that. You got to get multiple bids, not because you just want to just, you know, spin your wheels and waste time. It's because you need to see what that range looks like. You want to get support right around a number that makes sense because the same scope of work on the same property, the same exact thing to do, the same everything at the end of it, the deliverables, a 10 X difference. Like that's the most I've ever seen. I could say on the, on that scope, like of, of, of a scope of work, I didn't have that much discrepancy. 
right? Maybe you see 10, 20, 30% because that's someone's profit margin or maybe they're more efficient, but to have 10 times different, that's crazy. So don't take the 25K, go a little further, you know, push the envelope a little bit. See, is there someone out there that could do it for less? And if you saw a bid come through for less than that already, you're like, well, how low can it go? See, this is different. This is what I call, it's either done or it's not. I don't know that, I can't think of the name, but I call that, but it's like, it's either a yes or a no, it's binary, that's it. It's yes or it's no, like it's either fixed or it's not. This isn't like, I'm gonna make the kitchen look really nice versus the other guy does like kind of, eh. No, this is like literally, it's either gonna get fixed and resolved the right way, remediated and with the paperwork needed and, and the compliance and all that stuff, or it's not. Like, hey, there's a foundation issue that needs to be addressed, inspected by a structural, this is a different one, but let's say it was an inspection by a structural engineer and it's done, it's either yes or it's no. This isn't, I'm gonna refinish the cabinets versus I'm replacing the cabinets. Different. That's a different scope of work. So again, triple constraint, know what you're gonna do. I am the buyer. You must buy this property. This isn't a question. Oh, thank you, buddy. I'm getting deliveries from my youngest. Hey, bud, you out of school now? Okay, so hi, everybody. Cool. Got a yellow shirt on. I didn't even know you had yellow shirt. It must have been subconscious. Have you dipped the, um, peanut butter in the Dip the peanut butter in the fruit. Excellent, thanks, buddy. I love you, all right? This is Jude, baby Jude. Not babies, what, you're four now, so you know, he's not, he's not a baby. He's, he's not a baby. Right. What do you want to say? We're about wrapping up anyways, bud. Okay. Sure. So we happen to be both wearing yellow shirts. I didn't, I swear I didn't have this yellow shirt on before. And that's crazy. I must have seen your yellow shirt, buddy. I liked it. So listen, so when it comes down to it, we're here for you. I, I love, uh, you know, investing time with you guys every week and sharing stories. I can only do so much on a video on, on Facebook once a week with you. So if you want to get deeper and you want to learn how we can add more value, if, even if you're an experienced investor and you want to learn how to collaborate with our group, there's just people all across the country that are doing deals with each other that have nothing to do with us. They're just making those connections and figuring out ways to work together. Join the growth collective.com. I cannot emphasize it's free to go in there and just watch the video, you know, set up an appointment, you know, read the testimonials, amazing people in the group, blessed and honored to share the time with you guys every single week. And I will talk to you guys real soon. God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Good week. Say bye, Jude. Bye. <laughs> I give your eyes like that. You're so funny. Oh, man. See you guys. Bye, guys.